All right, we're going to start in just a second as soon as people join. See if this is working. Oh, good. It looks like it's working. Hopefully, people will be joining here any second. All right, I see people starting to arrive. If, you, uh, if you're joining, please let me know if you can hear what I'm saying and if the video and everything is working. Hopefully it's uh, do, working okay. I see a few people have joined. Uh, all right, sounds good. I got uh, I got verification that it's working. So welcome to the first live lecture for the offering of POSA concurrency. This, as you probably know, is the third course in a multi-MOOC sequence of courses called a specialization. And what I'm going to be doing today is giving you a very quick tour first through the website, just so you know what the course is going to be about. And then I'm going to go ahead and start covering a couple of the first uh, first lectures relating to Java threading and uh, synchronization. Tomorrow we'll have a, the second part of this week's session, which is really uh, going to present a little bit of stuff that we need for the first programming assignment. And then we'll cover the first programming assignment. I'll walk through it in more detail. And I'll also, uh, of course, answer any questions you might have. And I'll answer questions you have here as well. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to go to the course website. Let's see if you can hopefully see this. So this is the course website. Hopefully you can see that on your screen now. And I'm just going to give you a very brief tour through the material. So. Here's the announcements. This is, of course, you probably already know this. This is where we go to tell you important information about the course, uh, like, like the lectures that we're having. And I'll be posting very shortly the material we'll have for tomorrow's lecture, which starts a little earlier than normal, and I'll explain why later. Here are the discussion forums. This is where all the fun discussion takes place. You can see there's already a bunch of people who've come along and provided questions and some answers, so that's great. Really appreciate that. The video lectures are here. Uh, you'll see that there's something called week zero, and week zero is kind of overview, talking about what the MOOC covers, some background material on concurrency, why do you want to use it, what's hard about it, an overview of patterns and frameworks, and then a discussion about layers in Android with a focus on on uh, concurrency and communication. We're not going to cover this material live. These are things that are kind of background information. You're welcome to watch them. Uh, you don't, it's probably not a bad idea to watch the ones on motivating concurrency and the challenges of concurrency, but uh, you don't have to watch all this stuff. The things we're going to be doing in the class will be focusing more on the hands the hands-on features, the threads and Android concurrency frameworks and so on. Uh, each week, we'll have both live lectures as well as supplemental lectures. And if you read the FAC, which is available here, and which I strongly encourage you to read, it explains kind of how things work. This uh, FAC item number two explains the structure and format of the MOOCs that we're doing in a live way. And uh, so we'll have some stuff this week to talk about threading and synchronization, but there's also supplemental lectures, which we recorded a couple of years ago, which are a little shorter, a little bit more condensed, actually a lot more condensed, maybe not as interactive in some ways, but it's a good place to go if you want a real quick overview of what we're going to be covering. And we have each of these, each week has supplemental lectures, some weeks more than others. And these are ways for you to either kind of watch ahead to see what's coming or also just to uh, uh, see other ways of presenting the material. 
But the main focus of the course will be done through the live lectures, and you'll learn more about that as we go through it today. We also have quizzes and programming assignments. The first programming assignment is already out on the website. We will talk about that tomorrow, and that will, of course, also be recorded. Uh, everything that we cover here in the live lectures gets recorded, and you can then go back and watch it. I'll, I'll update it a little bit later, and you can find out more about how that all works, too, if you read the fact. So I, I strongly recommend reading or you know reading the facts to get a sense of things. Um, there's also links here that say where to get the source code for various uh, items, including, of course, the assignments and examples, as well as Android and Java source code. There's also information about installing and using Eclipse and Git. You're also welcome to use Android Studio if you want. It should Everything should work just fine, whether you use Eclipse or Android Studio. Here's the syllabus. This is a rough overview of what we'll cover. Some things may change a little bit, but this will give you a feeling for what we're going to cover in the course. And then for those of you who are taking the signature track and verified certificates, here's the information about the grading and uh, the weighting of the quizzes and the assignments and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a quick tour through the material here. The other thing that I will do uh, is after every few minutes in the course, I'll go through and take some questions. And these things will also be separated out in uh, the website. So uh, you'll be able to find out uh, sort of the Q&A stuff. Some people like to watch questions. Other people don't like to watch the Q&A section. They find it distracting. So we separate those videos out into different parts of the website. So you can see whatever you want. Uh, the lectures we'll do today, we'll probably have a couple hours worth of lectures today, which I will split up into smaller parts when I render the videos later. And uh, we'll have live lectures every week of the course. So you'll get a chance to uh, probably have about eight to 10 live lectures by the time we're all done, is my guess, give or take. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and start with the first set of slides, which I will bring up here in a second. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully, uh, you'll be able to see this. There we go. All right. Okay, so let's make that. Hopefully, that shows up properly on your on your end. If uh, if you have any problems or if, if I mysteriously drop out during the conversation, let me know. I, I'm keeping an eye open to the questions part so I can uh, get feedback from the students interactively. So the first topic we're going to talk about here is Java threads. And they're, of course, important as the foundation for concurrency in Android. And you'll also need to know something about threads in order to do some of the assignments in the course. Although later in the course, we'll be covering other Android concurrency frameworks that alleviate the need to know a lot about threads. So the first thing we're going to be doing here is we're going to be talking about what the Java threading mechanisms are and uh, how, how they work to program concurrent software. To understand Java threads, it helps to understand how to program Java threads. And in order to do that, you have to give the thread some code to run. And there's a couple of different ways to give Java threads some code to run. Uh, one thing that you need to do is you need to, one way to do it is to extend the thread class. Thread is a class in that's built into the Java language, and so it's always available. And so one thing you can do is come along and subclass from thread and overrun, override the run method. So here's a simple example. We're going to create and start a thread using a named subclass of a thread. So we have a class called myThread that extends thread. And the method that does the work is going to be in the run, the run hook method, as it's called. A hook method is just a method that can be overridden by a subclass to provide some functionality that the base class doesn't know about how to do, but it knows to call. Here we go ahead and make a new instance of my thread, and then we can start my thread. And as we'll see later, that basically launches a, a new thread of control in the virtual machine and the underlying operating system, and then that begins to run the run hook method that was defined earlier. You can also do this as a one-liner using an anonymous thread instance. So down here we could say new mythread.start, and that'll go ahead and start the thread to run. A second way to run a thread, create a thread and, and make a thread run, is to implement the runnable interface. 
So in this particular case, you're going to basically implement a runnable and override the run method, the run hook method. And there's a couple of ways to do this. One way to do this is to create and start a thread using a named class as the runnable. So here we have my runnable that implements runnable, and it fills in the run method. And then down here we can say new my runnable, and we can then pass that runnable to a new instance of a thread and tell that to start. So this is an anonymous thread, but it's a named instance of runnable that we're in instantiating here, and we're starting it. So you can see that there's a, an extra step here because we're making a runnable and then we're giving that runnable to the thread. Another way to do things is to use an anonymous inner class. So rather than going ahead and making an object as we've done here and then explicitly passing that to thread, instead we can go ahead and say new thread and then inside of the constructor uh, parameter to thread, we make ourselves an anonymous instance of an inner class called anonymous, or it doesn't have a name really, it's just an instance of a runnable. And then we can go ahead and override the run method and put the code to run in here. So this is a much more, uh, a bit more concise way, I guess by some definition concise, because you don't have to define a separate class. So it turns out that, that this approach is used very heavily in Java code and in Android code. You'll see this used all over the place as callbacks and, and various kinds of things to handle logic as callbacks. If you're in a position to use Java 8, there's a really cool extension to this, or actually it's not really an extension, it's actually a simplification using something called Lambda expressions. And so all this complicated boilerplate code here disappears and it just looks like this. So you basically say open close paren indicating a method that takes no parameters, and then you have an arrow, and then you write the code that you want to run in the run method here. Now, unfortunately, Android doesn't really support Java 8 yet, unless you use Retro Lambda. Uh, so I think it's called Retro Lambda. And uh, so we're not going to do a lot of Java 8 stuff. I just wanted to point out that there's some cool things that are coming down the pike that you can use now if you have the ability to program Java 8. And it makes your code a lot more concise. So that's basically how we go ahead and, and uh, create threads via a couple different means. Let's now talk about how to pass parameters to a started thread. So the run method that's defined in Java thread and in runnable doesn't take any parameters. As you can see, it's a, a no parameter method. So how can we pass parameters to threads? Well, there's a couple of different ways to do it. So one way to do this is to uh, basically create a class constructor and then go ahead and um, have that constructor store the information in private fields and then access, access those fields within the run hook method. So here's a case where we extend runnable, or sorry, we implement runnable, and then we add a, a private field. We store that field in the constructor of this class, and then the run method goes ahead and accesses that via the field. So that's that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to add a setter method. So rather than just using a constructor, you can also have a method called set thread type or whatever you want to call it. And then you do the same kind of thing. You assign the value, and then you go ahead and use the value inside of the, the run method. So those are the typical ways of getting access to parameters that you want to pass to a thread since you can't pass them to the run method directly. Let's next talk about running Java threads. So after start is called, the underlying virtual machine and operating system will go ahead and create the threads resources, and the Java virtual machine will then call the run hook method to start doing the work. And this involves a number of layers in the Java stack. So we've got the operating system kernel, of course, and the system libraries. These are typically written in C or C++, usually C for the case of threads. Then there's a Java virtual machine, which is typically written in uh, some Java with a lot of native code, and then that exposes an interface that's used by the thread libraries in Java util con concurrent. And so those are the layers we're talking about here. So when someone says new thread, that makes a new object, but only when they call start are the real resources allocated by the Java virtual machine and operating system. And we'll talk more about that in the next set of slides. And once the start method returns, then run is up and running, and then things are running concurrently. 
And so the original thread that created the new thread and the new thread are able to run concurrently and they're able to block independently of each other. Generally, any thread, any code can uh, be run in a thread, although there are some limitations that are typically framework or platform specific. So you can do almost everything in, in a run method. However, windowing toolkits often restrict which thread can access the GUI components, the, the various things like the views and the dialogues and the widgets and so on. Those can typically only be accessed by the main thread of control. And you can find out more about that here in the context of Android, where they talk about something called the UI thread or the user interface thread. And we'll talk a lot more about that later in the course. As long as the run method hasn't returned, either gracefully or non-gracefully, the thread will continue to, uh, to live and be alive. So, however, it, it's logically alive, but of course the underlying operating system and virtual machine scheduler can suspend and resume a thread many times over its life cycle, put it to sleep for reasons of, of being able to do preemption and other kinds of thread scheduling magic that the operating system does. If you want a thread to execute forever, then you simply need to put it in a loop that runs indefinitely. So you would say while true, or you'd say for, and just have a for with no, no uh, condition expression that ever causes it to terminate. Uh, obviously, you need to be careful about this in production systems because oftentimes you need to shut threads down, and we'll talk more about that later. After run returns, the thread is no longer considered to be alive. So if you call the is alive method, it, it'll return false after it's been shut down. Uh, you can use another method called join, which is important and is used in various programming assignments that we'll have here, that allows one thread to wait for the completion of another. So join allows one thread. It doesn't have to be the thread that created the thread, by the way. It could be a different thread. It allows it to wait for the thread to complete. And when the thread completes, when the thread exits, then the other thread can return from join. And we'll see later that there's various methods for join, there it's overloaded method, so it has timeouts um, and uh, or non-timeout versions. Join is what forms something called a simple means of barrier synchronization. We'll talk a lot more about barrier synchronization later. Barrier synchronization is used to allow threads to wait for each other in various ways, and there are other mechanisms besides join in Java, things like countdown latches and cyclic barriers and phasers and so on. And uh, I'll give you some pointers to more information to find about those things later. A thread can also simply evaporate where nobody waits to join with it, in which case it just goes away. And then the virtual machine and the operating system recycles the resources that are associated with the thread. There's a number of common Java thread methods that are worth knowing about. There are lots of methods, but we're just going to talk about some of them. These are the most common ones. There's one called set daemon that marks a thread as a daemon. A daemon thread is a thread that's defined in such a way that its lifetime is a function of the number of other non-daemon threads in the process. So when all the other non-daemon threads exit, then any daemon threads will also exit. Conversely, with normal threads, um, if the main thread exits, then the other threads can continue to execute. There's a method called start as we saw, that initiates thread execution. There's an abstract method called run, which is a hook method for user code. That's the method you fill in, or you provide a runnable that fills it in. There's a method called join, which is used for barrier synchronization to wait for threads to finish. Sleep is used to wait for a certain amount of time to elapse. There's a couple different variants of sleep that wait for milliseconds or nanoseconds. You can find out what the current thread is by calling current thread, which is a static method that will return the current thread, which can be used for debugging purposes and other, other mechanisms and other algorithms we'll see later. There's a couple of interesting ways of causing threads to shut down. We're gonna have a whole section about this in a minute, but uh, in a nutshell, interrupt can be used to post an interrupt request to a thread. And that's really the only uh, graceful way of having threads tell each other to shut down. You can't really stop them, and we'll talk about why you can't stop them later but you can interrupt them, and that posts a request to a thread. And then a thread can test to see whether or not it's been interrupted. And there's a couple of ways to do that. There's a method called isInterrupted, which is a non-static method that checks to see whether a thread has been interrupted. And you can call this method multiple times without affecting the status of the interrupt. And there's another method called interrupted, which is a static method 
And this checks to see whether the current thread has been interrupted or not. And this actually clears the interrupt status the first time it's called. So we'll talk more about these things later. They're, they're very important to understand the differences and how they work. There are also methods called set priority and get priority, which are used to set and get the priorities of the threads. And uh, that's often useful to give a bump or either a bump up or a bump down if you want to emphasize some computations over others. These methods establish various so-called happens before orderings. Take a look here. You can find out more about happen before. Happen before is a very important concept in Java concurrency and in concurrency in general because it deals with how information is shared and becomes visible and is made consistent between multiple threads, which is especially important in today's multi-core platforms, which pretty much everything is multi-core these days. For example, when you start a thread, starting a thread happens before the run method of the thread is called. Likewise, when a thread terminates, the termination of the thread happens before the join occurs with the terminated thread. And there's also many other examples in Java Util Concurrent of methods that establish happen before orderings. So, for example, placing an object into a concurrent collection happens before the access or removal of the element from that collection. And, and these are very important concepts because if you don't use synchronization properly, you'll have problems with happens before relationships and you'll have problems with your code not being consistent and visible and ordered properly. Now, luckily, Android takes care of an awful lot of these problems in its concurrency frameworks that we'll talk about later. So now let's go ahead and take a look at an example of starting and joining with Java threads. And uh, this is an example that you can, you can actually download here from this website. And this demonstrates the use of various thread methods to implement an embarrassingly parallel application. So I'll first go ahead and, and just explain what it does. And then I'll, I'll show you a little bit of the code. So this particular example spawns a bunch of threads. These are worker threads. And each of these threads searches for words in a list of strings. So we have a list of strings, and we have a bunch of threads, and they search for words in those threads. So we're going to call thread start to spawn a worker thread for each element in the list of strings. So if the list, let's say that there's 10 elements in the list of strings, we might have 10 threads one thread would search each string for words in the string. And then the main thread, and this is the key point of this example, is going to use thread join to wait for the worker threads to finish running. And that's an example of a simple form of barrier synchronization. No other Java synchronization mechanisms are needed for something that is this simple, because this is a very straightforward example that is embarrassingly parallel. What that means is that there's really little or no dependencies between the various computations that are taking place. Uh, later, we'll talk about other more interesting Java synchronization mechanisms like synchronized statements and um, wait and notify mechanisms on Java built-in monitor objects. All right, so let's go ahead and remove that guy. And then I will go ahead and start up my editor. I'll load the file in so we can all take a look at the code. Uh, I try as much as possible to, to look at real code examples in the, uh, in the class, because I, I find that people get a lot more out of the course if they actually get a chance to see how things work, and we don't just talk about them conceptually. So let me go ahead and bring up my editor. And um, while I'm doing that, let me answer a question that came in. Someone wants to know whether or not you can get the slides of the live, the live lectures, the live lectures. So those kinds of questions are, I will answer that question in a second, but those kinds of questions are really best answered by reading the FAQ. The FAQ has answers to that question and all kinds of other questions in it. And uh, if you take a look at the FAQ, you'll find that, yes, indeed, we, we do, in fact, put all the slides out. They're put out after the courses, after the live lectures are done. And uh, so in the next few hours, maybe later today and so on, you'll be able to uh, get access to all the slides. Okay, so let me go ahead. I've got my editor up now, and I will go ahead and share. So hopefully you can see the editor. Here's the source code for the thread join test. As you can see, this is all in one file. 
So let's just kind of walk through the file and I will show you how it works. So thread join test, you can see it's got a, a string. A little bigger, there we go. So we've got ourselves an array of strings and they have funny names in them. You'll see why they have these funny names in a second. And uh, then there's a, a list of words we're gonna search for, which are just the, the names for musical notes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna spawn a separate thread to search each of these strings for the musical notes. Now, of course, in real life, we probably wouldn't use a, uh, an array of strings. We'd have an array of files or something like that. But I'm just trying to keep it simple to focus on the concurrency and synchronization aspects. So we call the class that does this search one shot thread join. It's going to have a list of strings as input, and it's going to have an array of, of words to find. And it's also going to have a list of threads, which are the threads that were created to do the, the searching. And then we're also, of course, going to use these threads to join with the results when we're done. So we come down here. We have search one shot thread join. As you can see, well, we've set the parameters passed in to the fields. We make ourselves a linked list of worker threads. And then we go through the input size. That's the input we were given, the, the list of strings to search. And for each string in the input, we go ahead and make a new task using a factor method called make task that we'll look at in a second. And we take the task, which is a runnable, we make a new thread, we add that thread to the list of threads we're going to join with later, and then we go ahead and start the thread. So the thread is now running. So we're going to basically spawn off a thread for every element in the input list. And then down here in the main thread, we simply iterate through the list of worker threads, and we call join on each one. And join, of course, will wait until the thread is finished, and then join will return. So this loop only exits after all the threads are done with their processing. So that's what's called barrier synchronization. You're using this to wait in what's called an exit barrier. Here's the factor method that makes the runnable. When we call make task, we give it the index that we are going to have in the list. We make a new runnable whose run method will go ahead and look up in the input list, get the item at that location, and then it goes ahead and it calls a method called process input. Keep in mind that this method will be running in its own thread of control. And process input simply iterates through the words that uh, we're looking for. And it searches in the input data one word at a time. Uh, and it keeps looking until it finds all the words. And every time it finds a match, then it goes ahead and it processes the result. And as you'll see in a second, that just goes ahead and prints the result to the output. Uh, so it'll indicate whether it found a particular word in a particular string for a particular thread. And then here's just the way we print things out. Here's the main program. We go ahead and start the thread join test. We go ahead and we'll uh, create a new instance, an anonymous instance of search one shot thread join, which will pass in the parameters. And then that'll go ahead and run. And that will wait until it's finished and we'll uh, uh, print all the results out that happen to match. That's basically that, that simple program. You're welcome to take a look at this and other programs as you see fit. Um, and you can also go and take a look at the website for more information about that. OK, so we are done now with the first set of slides on threads. we got some more stuff to cover in a second. But um, we'll take a few questions now. If, if you're interested in, in having any of your questions answered, please feel free and, and go ahead and post them to the questions uh, portion of the IDE that you've got running with Google Hangout. And then I will receive them on my end, and I will go ahead and answer them. So there were some questions. Uh, what are my thoughts on RxJava? So RxJava is a, a reactive streams processing framework that was provided, I believe, originally by by uh, Netflix, and they use it for a lot of the code they write. It's a very cool processing model, and uh, it's actually not too dissimilar from some of the streams processing features that have been built into Java 8, with Java 8 streams and parallel streams and so on. And so very cool stuff. I, I like that style of programming quite a bit. 
Uh, we won't really cover much of that here because it's outside the scope of this particular MOOC, but it's uh, really cool stuff. Another question, what is barrier synchronization? So barrier synchronization is basically a uh, means of being able to allow threads to coordinate their interactions with each other. And there are two main forms of barrier synchronization. There's so-called entry barriers and there's so-called exit barriers. And entry barriers are typically used to force a bunch of threads to wait until they're all in position to enter. So this is used often for what's called gang scheduling, where you've got a group of threads that need to do some processing on portions of a larger object or a larger resource or a larger data structure. Like you might have a bunch of threads that will be used to do processing of different portions of an image. And so it'll go through uh, and all the threads will be processing different portions of the image. They may finish at different times. And then they wait on a barrier, typically a cyclic barrier, in order for the all the threads to be done. And then they all start over again and re-begin. So uh, that example actually is both an entry barrier and an exit barrier because you coordinate the beginning of all the threads and then you also wait for them all to finish at the end. There's also something called an exit barrier. And an exit barrier is typically used to have a thread or threads wait for other threads to finish before they continue. So for example, the, the thread uh, join example we just looked at, that's an example of using thread join as an exit uh, barrier. You're going to have the main thread wait for all the other threads to finish before it can continue on in its progress. And uh, we won't really cover barrier synchronization a lot in this course, but there's other material available if you take a look at the uh, FAQ, as always, that gives you more information about uh, other resources, other videos, other um, lecture series I or others have done that talk about some of these Java synchronization and concurrency mechanisms in more detail. Uh, another question, in the example we just discussed, is it a possibility that one of the threads that we start may get scheduled and complete their run method before the main thread calls join on that particular thread? Um, well, it doesn't really matter whether the other thread finishes before join is called. Uh, when the thread finishes, it leaves behind its some information about its state. And so when join is called, it simply goes and, and gets access to that information. So it doesn't really matter whether the, the run method occurs, a run method finishes before join is called or not. In both cases, uh, join will just return very quickly if the thread is already exited. So that's that's not a problem. Okay. So these are good questions. I think um, we're done with those set of questions. If you have more, of course, please don't hesitate to, to ask them, and I will cover them next time we take a break. So let me go ahead and bring up the next slide set. Whoops, it's the wrong button. There we go. Okay, you should hopefully be able to see this set of slides now. The next topic we're going to cover goes a bit more in depth about managing various aspects of the Java thread lifecycle. So we're going to talk about what the Java thread lifecycle is. And we're going to talk about how to manage it effectively. The main focus of this discussion really deals with learning how to stop or interrupt Java threads gracefully. We'll first start by talking about the different states in the Java thread lifecycle. A thread, as you might imagine, is actually a very complicated entity that interacts with lots of other things, both at the hardware level and the software level. And so you have to know how these the threads work, the states of the threads, and you have to understand how to manage their life cycle very carefully. So there's about seven different states, and we're going to talk about each of them. Two of the most important parts of Java involve starting and stopping threads. So we're going to pay particular emphasis there. To use Java threads effectively, you don't have to understand all the inner details we're about to discuss. That's only for people who want to have sort of wizard level knowledge. But it, it doesn't hurt to have a good understanding of these things because you'll often run into situations where your concurrent programs don't work correctly. And knowing how the threads transition between different states in their life cycle can help you with debugging uh, various, various defects that have crept into your code. We'll start by talking about the state machine for Java threads. As you can see, there's, there's, again, seven main states. You can see the states here in the documentation. There's also a nice UML diagram that gives you a, another more visual view of these states than what I've shown here. When you create a thread, when you say new 
thread object, you know, new my thread or new thread, et cetera, that transitions the state machine to the new state, which just allocates a few resources for the thread object. When you start the thread, that completes the initialization by creating more resource intensive objects like a stack. And that then makes the thread transition into the runnable state. Now, just because you say start doesn't mean the thread's actually running. All it means is that it's able to run. And it's the scheduler that decides whether or not to run the threads and when to run them. When a scheduler selects a runnable thread to run, it begins to run, and that is where its hook method, the run hook method, gets called back. If during the running of the run hook method, the thread sleeps, waits, or joins with operations that have a timeout associated with them, that transitions to the timed waiting state. And the thread will then basically be deactivated until the time period elapses or whatever it's, else it's doing occurs, like if the wait if it's notified or if it's uh, the other thread it's going to join with is going to uh, be exited, et cetera, then it'll transition out of the timed waiting state and it becomes runnable again. But again, it doesn't start running, it just becomes runnable. So let's say it's running again, run methods called, and now it attempts to access a so-called guarded resource, such as the intrinsic lock that's part of every Java object. We'll talk more about that later. So it tries to do that. It tries to have like enter a synchronized method or a synchronized block. And if that is in use, that will cause it to become blocked, in which case it will remain blocked until it is able to acquire the resource that it needs. And once it becomes uh, acquiring the resource, like it grabs a lock, it's now ready to run again, and the scheduler will run, will start it running at some point. It then may also call the cond wait method, which is a wait method that's part of the condition object that's part of every Java object. We'll talk more about that shortly as well. And that causes it to go into the waiting state, and it remains in that state and becomes deactivated until someone notifies it. So it notifies it either by calling notify or by calling notify all, and that will wake it up, put it back in the runnable, and then it can start to run again. While it's running, if it terminates for some reason, either it decides it's done and it exits the run method or an exception has occurred, either one, it then transitions to the terminated state. And from that point on, it can be basically shut down. Okay, let's go a little bit deeper now, talking about how we start and stop Java threads. So we'll start, we'll begin by discussing how we start a Java thread. So starting a Java thread involves some very interesting design and implementation issues. Um, calling start on a thread causes it to start executing its run hook method. And this actually triggers many, many steps in the Java middleware, virtual machine, and operating system layer. And if you're running on Android, there's even a few more steps involved as well. So the key thing to note here, I'm about to talk about these steps, but the key thing to remember is that starting a thread consumes a non-trivial amount of resources. So you've got to be prepared uh, to understand that you don't want to start threads just um, ha haphazardly. You want to do it for a reason. And usually that reason is you've got some fairly long running computations that make it worthwhile to start the threads. Um, you can go here and find all the Java source code. This is sort of my shorthand to say, here's the link, and then just replace this part here with the session number, which in this case would be um, 003 for this current session. That'll be how you can find that particular uh, location. That's where you find the source code for all the things we're about to talk about. So let's say a thread says my thread dot start. Underneath the hood, that will then call down to the thread start method, which is part of Java. And that will then call into the virtual machine thread create method, which is a native method. That on Android then calls into another native method that's part of the Android runtime. If you're using Dalvik, it's part of the Dalvik runtime. If you're using Art, it's part of the Art runtime and so on. And this would be a native method call. And then that will call even further down to some other methods. And then finally, these methods will call the underlying Linux Android pthread create method. And pthread create, as we can see here, passes in uh, some instructions to say how to start the thread and it passes in a method called interp thread start. 
An interp thread start is actually a C function pointer that will be used to as the entry point into the new thread that's being created with the runtime thread stack that was created by the operating system in Virtual Machine. Interp thread start, in turn, is an Android internal method that turns around and calls back up to your code. And finally, the run method, the run hook method, is called back on the object that invoked start to begin with. So as you can see, there's a whole bunch of steps that are going on here. And uh, you know your mileage may vary a little bit if you run a different operating system besides Android, if you run a different version of Android that I'm showing here. There may be a few minor differences, but the basic overall flow will be more or less the same. Okay, let's now start discussing how we stop Java threads. And we're going to see there's a couple of different ways to stop Java threads. So as it turns out, stopping Java threads is a lot more complicated than starting them. And uh, for those of you who have ever watched the famous Disney movie uh, Fantasia, there's a great clip called The Sorcerer's Apprentice. And it illustrates the complexity of trying to stop things once they're in motion. So if you replace uh, threads with broomsticks, you'll have basically the idea that's going on with the Sorcerer's Apprentice. The, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, which is Mickey Mouse, creates a bunch of broomsticks to do the work for him, and then the broomsticks turn out to be very hard to shut down. So that's kind of the metaphor to think about as we're discussing these features. It turns out that there's no way in Java to safely and involuntarily stop a Java thread. You can't, you can't do that. And there's a description here of why this is such a thorny problem in the Java uh, concurrency model. So what that means is if you want to have operations that run for a long time in a separate thread, they have to be coded specifically to stop themselves voluntarily. So there's one way to do this is to use a stop flag. So here's an example where we've got a class called my runnable that implements runnable. We've got a method called run. We've got a loop in here that's checking some long running operation. And as you can see here, what we do is we have a volatile Boolean called M is stopped that's set to, to false initially. And as long as it's not true, we keep running. And as you can see, this is defined as volatile. Uh, you can take a look at this link for more information about volatile. In a nutshell, a volatile, volatile is a type qualifier that indicates in Java that any changes to that variable are consistently and visibly propagated to other threads atomically. So uh, an easy way to think about this is irrespective of whether or not you have a multi-core or multi-processor machine with different memory that's local to each core or processor, when you use a, a volatile variable, whenever you read and write to it, it bypasses any caches that you may have in a core or processor and goes directly to the global memory. And it reads or writes directly to global memory. So that makes it certain that the information is propagated consistently and visibly to other threads atomically. We also add a method called stop me that sets m stopped to true. And when m stopped is set to true, then the thread down here that's running run will detect that as long as it remembers to check whether m is stopped is true or is not true. Uh, if you don't have that check there, of course, you'll keep running for an indefinite period of time, which is not, a, not at all what you want to do. OK, so this solution using volatile uh, variables is, is very, very lightweight, but it's not integrated into the underlying Java virtual machine, which is somewhat problematic because certain things uh, can't be tested for this way. In particular, any blocking operations, reads, blocking writes, uh, waits, joins, sleeps, all those other things won't be awakened by the means we just described here which could impede the shutdown processing in your, in your applications uh, for a very long period of time. So that's not a good way to go. Now let's talk about how to stop Java threads using interrupt requests. And a thread can be stopped by calling its interrupt method. 
And you can read more about Interrupt here, and I'll explain the key points, but it's a really good idea to read the documentation because it's kind of subtle. When you call Interrupt, this posts something called an Interrupt request to a thread. And Interrupts are, are implemented via an internal flag that's called the Interrupt status flag. And when you invoke thread.interrupt, that sets the flag. So it sets the flag on whatever thread you've just interrupted. Two threads, uh, there are two different accessor methods that can be used to check this flag. And each one has different side effects on the status. The is interrupted method, as we'll see, just checks and does not clear the status. The interrupted method checks and clears the status. And sometimes it's confusing to know which one to use. We'll talk about that in a second. Here's a very simple program that starts, runs, and interrupts a background thread. So we have a main program here, which goes ahead and creates a new thread, T1. And it does a bunch of work. We'll look at that in a second. And it's runnable. And then down here, we start the thread, which will go ahead and follow those steps we discussed earlier. And then the run method will be called. And it'll start to do work. It'll loop around doing stuff and calling these methods. We'll look at more in detail in a second. And that'll start running in the background. And then at some point, um, the main thread will decide it wants to interrupt the background thread. And so we'll take a look and see what happens when that occurs. Internally, the run method of the background thread calls methods that have to check periodically to see if the thread that is running has been stopped. So there's a couple of different options here. Let's take a look at both options. If you have threads that block in various library calls and system calls, then those library calls and system calls will automatically check to see whether or not the uh, interrupt has occurred and will take the appropriate reaction, typically throw an exception. So here's an example where you might call sleep or wait or certain kinds of blocking IO calls or join, et cetera. These are all things that block. And the operating system, the Java Virtual Machine, will automatically uh, detect when that thread has been interrupted, and it'll end up generating the interrupted exception, which you're then obliged to catch and do something with to clean things up. So for blocking operations, that's the way you do it. For non-blocking operations, you have to periodically check to see if the interrupt uh, has been called, if, if thread interrupt has been called. Let me fix this. I saw an annoying mistake, and I better fix it now, otherwise I'll forget. Let's see. So this is checking to see if red interrupt has been called. All right. Let's save that. Sorry about that. Get better to fix the bugs now and get them into the updated slide deck than have them lurk around. So, so if thread interrupt has been called, then there's a couple ways to check. Um, one way to do this is to call thread.interrupted. And thread.interrupted returns true if an interrupt request has been received by the thread. And whenever you call it, it clears the interrupt status. So it's only good to call that one time. In a typical thing to do if you're interrupted is to throw the interrupted exception. Another thing you can do is you can use the is interrupted method. And this method has to be called on a specific thread. You can't call it on a static method. You have to call it on a specific instance of a thread. And this returns true if an interrupt request has been received. However, it doesn't clear the interrupt status. So that status is still available. And you can come back and, and call this method multiple times. All these methods can actually be overridden. Um, and you'll actually see, if you take a look at various uh, other parts of the course, you'll see some examples of this. But it's rather rare, and you have to really know what you're doing in order to override the, the methods here. Here's a link that you can read more about how and when you should do this. OK, so here's a few things to remember when we talk about interrupting Java threads. Java thread interrupts don't behave like traditional hardware or operating system interrupts. You can read more about what an interrupt is here. They're actually quite different. They, the Java interrupts are delivered synchronously and non-preemptively, 
which means that the thread has to be prepared to handle them. They don't just handle, they don't just get handled asynchronously. In contrast, hardware interrupts or more traditional Unix signals, which are basically software-like interrupts, uh, those types of interrupts are asynchronous and preemptive. So you have no choice often but to handle them. In contrast, Java thread interrupts are not asynchronous and they are not preemptive. Therefore, you have to test for them explicitly. And usually you throw the interrupted exception uh, and that's thrown synchronously and must be handled synchronously by the calling thread or by the calling logic in the thread that's throwing the exception. There's a number of patterns for dealing with Java thread uh, interrupted exception. And so you take a look at this link here. There's a number of things you can do to program it, uh, program exceptions properly. One thing to do is to simply make the interrupted exception be part of the exception specifier on a method and don't worry about it and just let the caller of the method be responsible for handling it. So that's one approach. So the caller or callers must then handle the exception properly. You'll see lots of examples of that as we go through the course. Another thing to do is to catch the exception and then perform some specific cleanup operation and then rethrow it. So here's an example where we're waiting for something and if an interrupt occurs, we want to clear out some information that we stored in the queue and then rethrow the exception. The idea here is to avoid leaking resources or leaving the resources in an inconsistent state. Yet another thing to do is to uh, catch an exception and then restore the interrupt exception status by calling interrupt again. And that way, even if you're not going to handle it, you can push it up to uh, you can push it up a bit to the caller to know that something has occurred. And this basically preserves evidence that the exception occurred for higher levels of the call stack so that they knew something was interrupted. Portable solutions for Java thread programming require cooperation to stop threads. Threads have to check periodically to see if they've been told to stop. This is rather fragile, unfortunately, because all parts of a program have to follow consistent usage patterns. You can read more about this problem in this link. Um, and even though it's tricky and voluntary and tedious and error-prone, it's the way to go to stop Java threads. So you have to understand how these things work. OK, let's take an ex a quick look at an example of how to use Java thread interrupts. So this particular example, you can get this from this website. You can take a look at the code. We're not going to look at the code right now in detail, but I'll just outline it because it's very simple. Uh, this is a program that starts, it has a main thread that starts a background thread that's going to compute the greatest common divisor in the background for random numbers. And the run hook method that's running in the background thread checks periodically to see if it's been interrupted. because there's no blocking calls that are being made in the run method. It's just doing computation. It's not doing calls that are going to block. The main thread of control sleeps for about four seconds, and then it sends an interrupt to the background thread. And when the interrupt is sent, then, of course, the background thread will detect this and check to see if it's been interrupted. And then it'll go ahead and exit when it has been interrupted. OK, so that's basically an overview of the Java thread life cycles. What I'm going to do now is, is take a few more questions. Uh, people asked a good question, what book can we use as a reference? As is always the case uh, for questions like this, take a look at the FAC. The FAC has lots of pointers to information, uh, other resources for concurrency. And uh, there's so one of the best, two, two really good books I recommend you take a look at. One of the books is called, I think it's Java Concurrency in Practice by Brian Getz and a team of people that include some of the foremost Java concurrency experts in the world. There's also a wonderful book by my friend and colleague, Doug Lee, which is basically talking about concurrent programming in Java. It's a little bit old, but it's a, a classic book. It's got lots of great insights about how to write concurrent Java programs effectively. So those are some books to, to use. Then there's also other links in the fact to video resources. I have a whole series of, of video tutorials that talk about Java concurrency. Um, they're done by, by Pearson. It's part of the live lessons series on Safari. If you're a Safari 
book club member, you can go ahead and take a look there and, and access that material. There's also recordings from courses I teach here at Vanderbilt University on Java concurrency. And so I have my lecture screencasts for uh, various concurrency programming courses I teach, which you also might want to take a look at. And all that's also linked into the fact as well. Another question, I think this was the example from the thread join test. It says, are all the threads starting concurrently and executing simultaneously? Yes, that's, that's exactly the idea. Uh, the idea here is you have a bunch of things you want to search. In this case, we were searching strings, but you might want to search files or something else. And so we spawn separate threads for each thing we want to search, and we search those, those strings or files or whatnot concurrently. So yes, they're all running concurrently. What's the best way to avoid deadlock and detect them in code? So uh, if you take a look at the FAQ, you'll see that there's a really nice set of static analysis tools and dynamic analysis tools from a company called SureLogic. And they have some really nice, uh, some nice code that you can, some nice analysis tools that you can get access to and, and play around with. So take a look there. I believe that there's a free license you can get to use to to use in conjunction with the MOOC. So you'll find the license key and other information there. So running your code through these static and dynamic analysis tools is by far the uh, most effective way of trying to catch those problems. Actually, uh, <laughs> detecting deadlock is usually pretty easy because your program stops working. And uh, so it's usually pretty easy to figure out that something's gone wrong. Pre uh, preventing deadlock is a little trickier. And there's a bunch of techniques. If you take a look at operating system uh, books, you'll find out various algorithms can be used for, for uh, deadlock detection. A uh, question about blocking and non-blocking calls. So uh, things that block will put the calling thread to sleep until whatever is being blocked on comes to pass. So if you're a thread and you call thread join on another thread, that will block the calling thread until the thread is, is, uh, has exited. If you call wait, on a condition uh, object, either either a condition object or an implicit condition that's part of the Java monitor object, that will put the calling thread to sleep and it'll block until somebody notifies that thread to wake up. If you call sleep with some count in milliseconds or nanoseconds, that will block the calling thread until sleep time elapses. If you call read on a network connection that doesn't have any data yet, that read will block until it's uh, got data. So those are all examples of blocking calls. Non-blocking calls would either be non-blocking system calls, like non-blocking I.O. calls, which don't block if they, if they would uh, have a situation where they couldn't make progress. But more, more likely, non-blocking calls are just any old method call that you do that's comp computationally intensive and doesn't call blocking calls. So, for example, the thing that was computing the greatest common divisor, the GCD example I just talked about, there's no blocking calls in that thread. So those are all non-blocking. It's just a, it's called a CPU-bound or computation-bound operation, as opposed to an I/O-bound operation or a blocking system call operation. So those are some of the things that uh, you need to keep in mind. How to decide for which functions and tasks we use to use thread, we need to use threads for, specifically when the time duration of the task is unknown. Uh, well, obviously that's uh, more of an art than a science, but a good rule of thumb is if you expect the operation to take a long time or an indeterminate amount of time, then threads are probably a good idea. Uh, if you know that your computation will take a very short amount of time, it's probably not worthwhile using a thread. If you're going to add one plus one, or for that matter, add just two normal built-in numbers, either doubles or ints or floats or whatnot. Uh, spawning a thread to add two numbers together is probably not a good idea. Uh, on the other hand, if you're gonna do some computation that might run quickly or might take a long time, you probably want to use a thread or a task or some concurrency mechanism because you don't want to be blocking things uh, for an indeterminate amount of time. And that becomes especially important in Android as we get a little further along and we start talking in Android about the user interface thread and how the user interface thread works. You'll see very quickly that uh, you need to be careful because if you have things that run for too long, then the dreaded application not responding dialogue pops up and uh, bad things will happen. 
Um, how to be sure our code will run properly during the running program all the time? Uh, well, the, the best way to do that, of course, is to become a good programmer and apply static and dynamic analysis tools to your code to find obvious bugs, to also get in the habit of uh, you know, using unit tests and integration tests to make sure that you can test your code for regressions and problems. And then if you're really hardcore, you probably want to learn a bit about formal methods or other techniques that you can use to try to prove various properties of your code, which of course really are what model checkers or a static analysis tools are doing. They're just doing it for you in an automated way. So there's, there's obviously no magic silver bullet that makes your code uh, bug free, at least not yet, but uh, you can certainly go a long way to, to do it by becoming a better programmer and, and also by learning about patterns, of course. Uh, there's a question. What is non-trivial resource here? I'm not quite sure what that question refers to, but I'll, I'll take a shot at it. And if you want to, to clarify it, I'll be happy to answer it maybe in the next uh, QA session. So I'm assuming non-trivial resource would be either referring to something that takes a long time to run or uses a uh, non-trivial amount of space. So either, either uses a non-trivial amount of time, in other words, it runs for a long time, or it uses a non-trivial amount of space. In other words, it's very big. But I don't really understand the, the context of the question, so uh, please feel free to re-ask it if you have other questions. Okay, we have now gotten through all the stuff about threading. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start talking about synchronization. And to do that, let me bring up my next set of slides. All the stuff we're talking about here is going to be helpful for doing the first programming assignment, which is why we're covering it now. The next topic here is built-in monitor objects, and there's two parts to this discussion. We're going to talk about what monitor objects are and how they can be used to ensure mutual exclusion and coordination between threads running in a concurrent program. In order to do this, we're going to show an example of a, a buggy concurrent Java program that's going to be concurrently calling put and take methods on something called the simple queue. And we'll see that if we're not careful, we'll end up corrupting the internal state. And uh, we're gonna show how to fix this problem by applying monitor objects. And as we'll see, monitor objects will give us a bunch of different features to make things better. They give us something called synchronized methods and statements, which use an entrance queue to ensure only one thing at a time is running inside the object. And they'll also use a wait queue to be able to wait and notify to coordinate the interactions between different threads. All these features I just described are something called a monitor. A monitor is a pattern. It's a concur concurrency control construct that's been around for 40 or 50 years. It's been around a very long time, and it's used for synchronization in concurrent programs. There are three capabilities a monitor provides to concurrent programs. The first thing it provides is it allows you to ensure only one thread at a time is able to access critical sections within an object. So that's one of the key features. Mutual exclusion is just a fancy way of saying one thing at a time. And we'll see some examples of that later. You can read more about critical section here. It also ensures that threads running in a monitor can block efficiently waiting for certain conditions to become true. So if you're unable to make forward progress while you are the one and only thread running inside a monitor, then you can step outside the monitor using what's called a condition, and you can wait for the condition expression you're waiting on to become true. And then the third thing you can do is you can notify other threads that conditions they're waiting on may have been met. So that's a way to wake up people who are waiting. So those are the three main things a monitor does, and we'll talk more about this later. There's a bunch of human known uses of monitors. One example that might be worthwhile to think about just to make it more intuitive would be some kind of a, of a hospital room, like an operating room in a hospital, where you want to be able to allow people to queue up waiting to get access to the operating room, which is a critical section, let's say for hygienic purposes to reduce the likelihood of infection only one person, only one patient can be in the operating room at a time. 
of course, you can have multiple doctors, um, but only one person could be in there. And they have to wait in a pre-operating room outside of the critical section for their turn to come in. And after they're done, they can go to a post-operating room to wait to leave. But only one patient is in the operating room at a time. So let's take a look at a simple example to motivate why we need to have monitor objects. And we'll, we'll look at this in a couple different vantage points. Um, the example here is based on Java's array blocking queue. And um, so we'll take a look and see how an array blocking queue works. Here's a UML sequence diagram that shows the design of our buggy solution. And you can find the buggy solution. If you, if you like to run buggy code and try to figure out why it's buggy, you can take a look at the code here for the buggy solution. So we have a main program. And that main program spawns two threads, a producer thread and a consumer thread, both of which access a simple queue. And then when those threads start to run, they alternate, or they don't alternate, they both call put and take on the simple queue concurrently. And of course, we'll see in a second that that causes all kinds of problems with respect to race conditions, which are uh, situations where you're corrupting the internal state of an, an object by having multiple threads simultaneously try to read and write its fields in an unprotected way. But here's an example of the simple blocking queue. It implements the blocking queue interface. Um, and take a look here for more information about blocking queue. It creates a resizable array implementation called an array list. Uh, you can read more about the array list here. And then it has a pair of non-synchronized public methods, put and take. And the idea is that these are trying to add and remove the elements from the queue. It'll add an element at the end and take the element from the front. So that's what it's trying to do. Here's the main program. It goes ahead and creates this simple queue. It creates a pair of threads, a producer and a consumer. It starts the producer and consumer threads, and then those threads begin to run. As you can see, what they do when they run is they sit there, and one thread will put the uh, a string to the queue, and the other thread will go ahead and take the string out of the queue. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to have these things communicate, the two threads communicate through a, uh, a simple queue. The question, of course, is what's the output of this program, and why does it behave the way it does? Well, if you run this program, you'll see it will do bad things. It'll crash and, and give you strange results and so on. And the reason why, of course, it does that is that there's several reasons why, but one of the reasons why is that there's no protection against the critical section, which is basically the part that's the shared state, which is the list, um, being accessed concurrently by multiple threads. And if you read the documentation for ArrayList, you'll see it says that the implementation of ArrayList is not synchronized. So if multiple threads try to access it, then it must be synchronized externally. And uh, that, of course, is what we're going to end up doing here, because we're going to be ensuring that we synchronize these things properly. So the problem here has a funny name. It's, it's a name called a race condition. And race conditions occur when you have multiple threads accessing fields that are not protected by the proper synchronization mechanisms. And this is a very tedious and error-prone thing to try to address. And it's why understanding patterns of effective concurrent programming in Java is so important, especially if you're writing Android code, where you almost have to have concurrent programs well, for reasons we'll talk about later. We're going to fix all these problems by applying various built-in monitor object mechanisms in Java. And so let's start talking about those next. So we're going to talk about how to fix these problems using the several mechanisms that Java provides. Java provides a couple of different built-in monitor object uh, mechanisms. So let's talk about them. All objects in Java can be used as monitor objects. And they support two types of thread synchronization. They support mutual exclusion, which allows concurrent access and updates to shared data, data fields or, or data shared by threads without incurring race conditions. So they, they solve the issue of, of concurrency. And then there's also something else that they do. Oh, and they do this. They, they support mutual exclusion via something that's called synchronized methods or blocks. 
And basically, the synchronized methods and blocks use something called the entrance queue. And this is managed internally by the Java virtual machine. And we'll talk a bit later on about how that actually works under the hood. Every Java object has a single so-called intrinsic lock that's associated with it. And if you make a synchronized method or a synchronized statement, it's that intrinsic lock that's being acquired and released. And there's also something called coordination. So every monitor object also supports coordination. And that enables threads to cooperatively schedule their interactions. And it does this using something called a wait queue. And the JVM supports coordination via a wait queue and various notification mechanisms that are built into it. And we'll talk later about how that works as well. Every Java object has a single intrinsic condition associated with it. So there's a single intrinsic lock, and there's a single intrinsic condition. And that actually causes some issues for which other Java synchronization mechanisms are required, which we'll touch on later. These mechanisms implement a variant of the monitor object pattern. We'll talk a lot about patterns in this course. Take a look here. You can read more about the monitor object pattern. You can also find out about this from the pattern-oriented Software Architecture Volume 2 book, Posted 2. The intent of this pattern is to ensure that only one method runs within an object and to allow an object's methods to cooperatively schedule their execution sequences. So you can see how the, the monitor object pattern is obviously what Java's monitor objects are implementing. You can also implement monitor object pattern in other languages besides Java, like C++ or C Sharp or C or Ada or whatever. We're going to use monitor objects to implement a better solution to the buggy simple queue and the inefficient busy synchronized queue solutions. <clears throat> so we'll see how that's all going to work. Let's first start by talking about built-in synchronized methods. These are the, the most fundamental part of Java monitor objects. They're very simple, somewhat limited, but very simple. And we're going to, to show these things, we're going to have something called the busy synchronized queue. So this is a way to fix some of the problems with the simple queue that we had before. You can see the busy synchronized queue here at this link. This thing is going to be able to implement blocking queue, which has a certain set of interfaces we expect, a certain set of methods we expect. And it's going to have some internal state, which is going to be the list and the capacity. And those are protected against race conditions. We want to protect them against race conditions by using synchronized methods. Here's the constructor. It initializes the internal state. Here are the methods, put, take, and is empty. All of these are marked as synchronized, and that means only one of them can run at a time. And, and I'll show you how that works. Only one can run at a time on a given object. So that means they're serialized with respect to other synchronized methods on an object. And this is very important. If you have two different objects, each of which has synchronized methods, and they're not static methods, then calls on those two different objects can actually run in parallel. So it's only within an object that matters. And you can think about synchronized as basically a way to provide so-called fully bracketed access to a critical region. And fully bracketed means the thread that acquires the lock, the intrinsic lock, to enter the critical section must be the thread that releases the lock on the way out. That's what fully bracketed means. And we'll talk about uh, how that works. When we use these in the method signature, the access to the entire body of the method is serialized. So if we say synchronized here, this covers everything from open curly brace to closed curly brace. We'll see later in a second that there's other more fine-grained ways to handle this. Those fine-grained ways, of course, are called synchronized statements. As you can see in this example we're going to look at here, which is actually from, from Java. Uh, Java has something called the exchanger. Synchronized methods can yield excessive serialization overhead. So here's an exchanger. You can find out more about exchanger here. And what we have is a method called create slot, which is a synchronized method. As you can see up here, it's synchronized. And inside of this, the whole method is synchronized. And what's going to happen is we're going to make ourselves a new slot. And then we're going to check to see if an item is uh, initialized or not, and if it is not initialized, we're going to initialize it. So we're going to lazily create the slot if it's the first time that it's accessed. And this whole method is synchronized, which means that that entire chunk of code can only have one thread operate on it at a time. 
that turns out to be excessive. That's more locking than we really need in this case. So here's another example of rewriting this method. And instead of having synchronized be part of the signature, instead we move synchronized into just the portion of the method that really needs to be locked. And this is what's called a synchronized statement or a synchronized block. You can read more about it here at this link. Synchronized statements are important because they enable more fine-grained serialization than synchronized methods because we can only we only need to synchronize a particular region in a method, not the whole method. So for example, in this case, these calls here where we make a new slot and we assign arena to the local variable um, A here, these are actually uh, not synchronized. I should probably put the word final after them as well or before them as well, but I don't think the Java code had that when I looked at it. Uh, so basically, we're creating the slot outside of the lock to narrow the region in which synchronization has to be performed. And that will help us get higher concurrency, especially on a multi-core processor. So only this statement here within the curly braces is serialized via the intrinsic lock. So this is using the intrinsic lock. We can also use other kinds of things. We can explicitly synchronize with another object. Every Java object that's not a built-in type, built-in types would be things like double, int, float, and so on. Every Java object can be used to synchronize because every Java object has an intrinsic lock that's part of it. We would normally say synchronize this here, but we could also say synchronize on A, which is this arena uh, object down here. You can also see something called the double-check locking optimization pattern. I'm not going to go into too much detail right now, but uh, if you read this link, you'll find out about more about double-check locking optimization, and that's basically what this code is implementing here. Okay, so you can read more about synchronized statements here at this link. I, I highly recommend you do it. Um, you'll have to understand how these things work in order to do the programming assignments in the course, so you might as well take some time to read more about it and ask questions on the discussion forum. So armed with what we know now, let's now take a look at a partial solution using Java synchronized methods. So this is going to be a partial solution, so it's not going to solve all the problems. Here's our busy synchronized queue example. As you can see here, we have synchronized keyword put on take and put, which means that those things are serialized. Only one synchronized method can be active at a time in a given object. And <clears throat> Adding the synchronized keyword either in the method or in a, in a synchronized statement has two effects. The first effect is that invocations of put and take on the same object can't interleave. What that means is that they run atomically. Put runs to completion before take runs or take runs to completion before put runs, but we don't have to worry about them uh, running a little bit of put and a little bit of take at the same time. That's one thing that happens. And so this means that each method is atomic. So if one call to put is running, then a call to take or another call to put by different threads will have to block. So that's the way to think about it. And the second thing that happens is there's a happens before relationship that ensures that when we add something over here, when one thread adds something to the, to the list over here, that that will be properly propagated over here. So there will not be inconsistent or misordered access to memory because the synchronization uh, synchronized statements will flush out the caches as things change there are some limitations of java synchronized methods uh, and that's important to understand what we're about to talk about next so if we only use them and we don't do anything else if we just use synchronized methods or blocks then calls to these put and take methods will busy wait and that can lead to all kinds of problems the most Obvious problem with busy waiting is that you'll waste CPU cycles spinning, doing nothing useful, like a like a hamster or a gerbil in a in a little running wheel. Uh, so that's a bad use of things. You, there are also potentially problems with starvation here as well. Uh, but basically, spinning is a bad idea for stuff like this, unless you're building a hard real-time system to do something like control the temperature in a nuclear reactor or uh, modify the flight surfaces on an airplane control wing or something like that. So what we need to do, instead of just busy waiting, is we need to have some vehicle, some mechanism 
to coordinate put and take so they don't busy wait when there's nothing to do. And of course, the way to do that, which we'll talk about in a minute, is to use the wait and notify mechanisms provided by Java monitor objects to provide a convenient and efficient solution. Okay, so that's the end of that set of slides. I will now go ahead and take uh, some questions and then we'll start talking about the next uh, set of slides to talk about wait and notify. So one question is, the, the links <laughs> are the links popping up on the bottom available somewhere? Uh, so when we put the slides up, when the, the slides are made available later, probably later today or tomorrow at the latest, then you can download the PDFs with all the uh, all the links, and all the PDF links are active. So all you have to do is just click on them in the PDF slides, and they will magically appear. If you read the fact, you'll also see that in the past, people have crowdsourced the links and put them up on the wiki site. So you might also want to do that. You might want to coordinate with other students if you want to uh, put them in one place. But the easiest way is probably just to grab the slides and then click on them from there. Um, there's a question here. Will consumers consume at the same time? Um, not really sure what you mean by will consumers consume at the same time. I'm guessing uh, what happens here is that um, it's a bound, it's basically a, a buffer, it's a, it's a queue. And so in this particular case, if the queue is empty, then people will spin, which is bad in this case, but that's what they'll do. Uh, but at least that's the busy synchronized queue at least is correct. It won't be incorrect. It just, just will spin. If, there's, if there are items in the queue, however, then each thread will grab the item and they can go off and, and process and consume them concurrently. So yes, that will be concurrent. Uh, another question, what does it mean to serialize? So serialize is a funny word. It means different things in different contexts. If this was a course on I.O., in input-output or file storage in Java, then serialize would refer to a way to take the state of a Java object and then write it out in a form that it can be reconstructed later to rebuild the object, say, after sending it across a network or storing it in a file. That's one use of the word serialize. That is not how we're using it here. In this context, serialization really refers to ensuring mutual exclusion to, in, to make sure that there's only one thread at a time in the critical section of an object. So serialize means basically to, uh, to sequence or to only allow one thing to happen at a time. So uh, just to give you some examples of everyday life of serialization, if you live in a country that uses uh, trains to, to transport yourself around, then you're undoubtedly familiar with the idea of having multiple trains sharing the same track. So you sure as heck want to make sure that you serialize access to that railroad track that's shared. Otherwise, you'll have trains colliding with each other and having bad things happen. Uh, likewise, if you live in other countries where they have fast food restaurants like McDonald's, when you go through the drive through window, that serializes all the cars. So they go through the window one at a time, as opposed to going in to the uh, restaurant and having concurrent access at the counter, the counter service versus drive through service. Yet another example would be uh, a bathroom on an airplane where you have a, uh, a locking protocol where one person at a time is allowed to be in the bathroom and the people have to queue waiting for their turn to go in. And if you uh, look at the little door on, on an airplane, if you've flown on an airplane before, it has two states, occupied or vacant. And the protocol is you can only enter if it's vacant. And as soon as you go in, you turn the latch to become occupied. And then nobody else can come in until you're done. That's also an example of serialization. What exactly synchronization means? So as we've discussed, synchronization really refers to two things. It refers to mutual exclusion, which we get via serialization, as we just talked about. And the second thing that, that ser a synchronization means is coordination, meaning that things happen at the right time, in the right order, and under the right conditions. So those are really two of the main meanings of, of synchronization. 
And we'll see that there's lots and lots of synchronization mechanisms in Java. And I, I highly recommend you watch some of the intro uh, videos in week zero for more high-level discussions of these points. Are the interrupts we discussed in the previous slide the same as hardware interrupts? No. If you go back and watch the video on Java interrupt mechanism, it explicitly says that Java interrupts are not the same as hardware interrupts or as the kind of interrupts you get with, say, Unix signals. So they are very different. Java interrupts on the Java uh, thread threads are synchronous and non-preemptive, whereas hardware interrupts or Unix signals are asynchronous, typically, and typically preemptive. Uh, let's see. If there are several synchronization requests at a time, is it possible to flag those requests as priority states to avoid race condition? Um, I don't really understand what the question you're asking. So for the simple mechanisms we have with Java synchronized methods and synchronized statements, there's only one thing in a critical section at a time. So if you have multiple synchronized requests, in other words, multiple threads trying to access a critical section, then the entrance queue that's part of the Java monitor object implementation that's created and managed by the Java virtual machine will simply uh, queue up those things in some order, might be FIFO order, might be a different order, and it'll ensure only one thing is active at a time. Um, so there are other mechanisms like stamped locks, which are more sophisticated and support optimistic locking, but we're not going to talk about them in this uh, context because they're outside of the scope of Android since they are in Java 8 and Android doesn't support Java 8 yet. Does the virtual machine prevent the blocking circle between threads? I think the question you're asking is will the Java virtual machine uh, prevent deadlock? I think that's what you're asking. The answer is no. Uh, if you write code with deadlock in it then things will deadlock quite nicely and you will have uh, all kinds of fun trying to detect and figure out strategies to, to remedy that. But the Java, Java virtual machine absolutely does not try to save you from those kinds of things. Okay, we have one more section here for today, and then we'll be done. So let me go ahead and bring this up. So the second part of the bot Java built-in monitor object lecture will go a little further and focus on the coordination aspects uh, that are provided by Java monitor objects. In particular, we'll talk specifically about the notify and wait mechanisms. So there's a couple pieces to this. Um, if you recall our earlier discussion, Java synchronized methods and synchronized statements only provide a partial solution. And to avoid this, there are some additional features that are provided that help to coordinate interactions. And these are the wait, notify, and notify all methods. These methods are defined on Java object itself. Wait is used to cause the current thread to wait until another thread invokes the notify method or the notify all method for an object. Notify is used to wake up a single thread that's waiting on the monitor. And notify all is used to wake up all the threads that are waiting on the object's monitor. So this wakes up one, this wakes up all. And we'll talk later about why you would use one versus the other. Each Java monitor object has an entrance queue and a wait queue. I talked about this before. You can read about this in the Wikipedia links. And so when you go into a monitor object, you initially start out in the entrance queue if there's other threads that are waiting. <laughs> and while you're running, you can decide to wait, in which case you temporarily step outside of the critical section and you wait on the wait queue for your chance to go back in to the critical section. So we use the entrance queue to serialize thread access to the monitor object's critical section and anytime you call wait, that's done on the wait queue. When you call notify or notify all on a an object that also applies to the wait queue by waiting, waking up one or all threads that are currently waiting on that queue. 
So here's some simple examples. This is now, now we have a new class called Simple Blocking Queue. And Simple Blocking Queue is going to fix the problems we had with uh, the earlier implementation that was the uh, either the, the buggy queue or the busy synchronized queue. So what's going to happen here is whenever you call put, we're going to go ahead and check to see if the queue is full. If the queue is full, we're going to wait for the queue to be not full. So that's a way to put ourselves to sleep when we can't make forward progress. When wait is called, and this is very important, it atomically releases the intrinsic lock, which was acquired because this was a synchronized method. And then it goes ahead and sleeps on the object's wait queue. So the object that's an instance of simple blocking queue, this wait call will release the lock and then go to sleep on the wait queue. This implements what's called the guarded suspension pattern, and we'll talk more about that later. When we finally get a chance to, to go ahead, because the queue is no longer full, we add an item to the queue, and then we go ahead and we notify anybody who's waiting that the queue is no longer going to be empty. So this is a way to notify everybody that there's something changed in the queue. And that'll wake up all the threads that are blocked on the wait queue. Now this actually turns out to be somewhat problematic for a variety of reasons having to do with performance, but uh, that's why Java also supports something called condition objects, which we won't talk much about in this MOOC, but is available in other videos on my website. We'll talk more about put and take later. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism. Under the hood, these monitor objects are implemented using POSIX mechanisms. POSIX is, is the portable operating system for Unix that defines a standard way of interacting with hardware, and operating systems like Solaris or Linux implement POSIX. And so the entrance queue into a monitor object is implemented in Android in most, and in most Java implementations with something called a POSIX mutex, which is a mutual exclusion lock that supports recursive locking semantics. And you can read more about mutexes here. Likewise, wait queues can be implemented with something called POSIX condition variables. And you can read more about them there. Uh, they basically allow multiple threads to queue up waiting for a chance to access some resource that's controlled via a condition expression using the guarded suspension pattern. And they're very similar to Java condition objects. We'll talk about them a little bit later, but they're better found other places besides this MOOC. Okay, let's take a look now at how the simple blocking queue example works. We're going to look at it first from a visual point of view, then we're going to look at the source code. So first we're going to take a look. You can look see the source code is here at this link, and we're going to zoom in and kind of look at how it's going to work visually. We're going to have a queue of threads that can block on the monitor locks entrance queue, and another queue of threads that can wait on the monitor conditions wait queue. So let's take a look. Let's say we have the situation where we're going to try to take an element out of the queue. And let's say, for the sake of argument, the queue is empty to begin with. So somebody calls take, that causes the monitor object uh, to, to go into the, the region up here via the entrance queue. Since there's nobody else there, we acquire the lock. That thread is now running in the critical section of the simple blocking queue object. And then it goes and it checks to see whether or not the list is empty. Because the list is empty, we're going to assume that it's going to have to block. So it calls wait. And then that causes it to atomically release the intrinsic lock and then go block on the monitor condition. So this thread is now over here blocked. It's stepped outside the critical section and it's waiting to re enter the critical section when it's notified. Now, another thread comes along, thread T2. And this thread is going to be putting stuff into the queue. So it's going to be putting something in. So it comes in, it enters the monitor object, there's nobody else there, it acquires the monitor intrinsic lock, and it goes ahead and it adds an item to the queue, and then it calls notify all. And notify all, as we'll see in a second, is going to wake up this waiting thread over here, T1. So after it notifies, it then releases the lock and it exits the monitor object. At that point, because it notified thread T1, T1 wakes up and it unblocks on the monitor condition 
and then it goes and it tries to re-enter the critical section, which is protected by the entrance queue and the intrinsic lock. If there was something else already there, it would have to wait. If there's nothing else there, it can reacquire the lock, re-enter the critical section, and now it'll decide, it'll detect that the queue has actually got an element in it, and so it'll be able to remove the element from the queue and then return and release the lock and exit the monitor object. So those are the basic steps that are going on there. Here's the same thing, except now we're going to look at this from a code perspective as opposed to a visualization perspective. Once again, you can grab the, the implementation here. There's a couple different places you can get it. Uh, we have an internal state that has to be protected against race conditions. The constructor sets that state. We could make this, these could be final if we wanted to. And then the thread can wait for a condition in a synchronized method. So here is the synchronized method called take. And this uses the guarded suspension pattern. Take is going to acquire the monitor lock and wait while the queue is empty. So it comes in here, it gets the intrinsic lock, and it checks to see if the queue is empty or not. Uh, let's say, for sake of argument, the queue is empty. We then have to wait. Wait will atomically release the lock and go to sleep. You almost always, not always, but almost always want to call wait in a loop. And that's because when you're awakened, when somebody notifies you, the condition you're waiting on may or may not be true. So you always have to recheck it. When wait returns, it automatically acquires the intrinsic lock. And therefore, whenever you check this condition, this condition is always checked with the lock held, the intrinsic lock held. So the waiting thread can't assume the notification it receives is for its condition, so it has to do the check. You can read more about these situations in the cases here. The thread that's blocking on wait won't continue until another thread notifies it that the condition may be true. So here's an example of where that would happen. So here's take, now we're in put. In put, you can see that we block while the queue is full, and we check to see whether something's full by checking the capacity. And if it's not full, we add the message and we notify. So that call to notify here will then notify everybody. Now, this is actually a, a limitation from Java monitor objects, which have the weird quirk that there's only one monitor condition for each monitor object. That's the reason why Java also supports something called condition objects, which we'll briefly mention later, but are really outside the scope of this class. So once notify all is called, that will cause the thread that's blocked in wait to wake up, and it'll reacquire the lock reevaluate the condition, and then it'll go ahead and continue, and it'll remove the item from the list, and it will call notify all to let anybody know that there's the queue is no longer full, and it releases the lock when it returns. Those are the basic steps. That's just showing you how you typically program this kind of code. It's very stylistic or, or idiomatic. It always looks pretty much the same, and the other thing to note is that people typically don't program to this type of code directly. They build library interfaces or frameworks to encapsulate the complexities of programming at this level of abstraction. So I'm just showing you how it works under the hood so you'll be aware of it. But uh, in practice, you may not program this level very much because you'd want to build abstractions that shield developers from these complexities. So let's talk about some of the traps and pitfalls of using Java built-in monitor objects. There's a bunch of things you have to be aware of to use them properly. As I mentioned before, there's only one wait queue and one entrance queue per monitor object. And you can read about the problems with this in a paper I wrote many years ago. The big problem is something called nested monitor lockout. Nested monitor lockout occurs because the outermost method will acquire the intrinsic lock. And then if you call into a, uh, a nested object, that intrinsic lock will still be held, and therefore other methods that try to call on the class will not be able to access them. So that can lead to tricky problems that are described in this tutorial that are worth knowing about. You have to be very, very careful with nested monitor lockout with Java monitor objects. Then there's also the fact that monitor locks lack certain features that are provided by a reentrant lock. So there's another class in Java called a reentrant lock which gives you more features. For example, it supports um, conditional locking, 
time conditional locking and the ability to lock in a way that's interruptible, whereas the built-in synchronized methods and synchronized statements are not interruptible and cannot be acquired conditionally. So those are some lacks of features in the built-in stuff. And Java Rantrant Lock adds that additional capability. There's some other problems. There's some subtleties associated with using notify versus notify all. There's a, a good question, there's a good set of discussions here in this Stack Overflow article that talk about the trade-offs between the two methods. As a, as a general rule, you can only use notify in certain situations. And those situations are in situations where there's uniform waiters. That means all waiters always are waiting for the same condition expression. And the reason for this is there's only one condition per wait queue. And the other thing is you can have to, you can only do this if each thread executes the same logic after the wait returns. So as a result, if you use monitor objects in built-in monitor objects in Java, then you typically have to use notify all because oftentimes they wait on multiple conditions, such as the, the queue being empty and the queue being full. Uh, there's also some fairness issues related to the order in which threads are notified. By default, the semantics of Java are so-called haphazard notification. And so to avoid haphazard notification, you can apply the specific notification pattern, which you can read about here at this link on my website, which is a paper that describes how to do specific notification in Java. Basically, specific notification allows you to have the implementation choose which thread to run based on certain properties, like how long it's been in the queue or its priority, et cetera. As a rule of thumb, the built-in Java monitor object mechanisms we talked about are, are very uh, popular and efficient and common. But if you do really sophisticated concurrency control, you're going to need more. And so you really need to understand Java util concurrent and Java util concurrent locks, which is a bit outside the scope of this MOOC. But um, if you're doing just doing Android programming, what we've covered here so far is probably sufficient. If you're doing Java programming, especially Java server-side programming, then you really need to understand these more powerful mechanisms. Android provides a whole bunch of concurrency frameworks, which we're going to talk about starting next week, which overcome the limitations with these low-level Java mechanisms when applied in the context of the Android development environment. And so we'll see that there's a couple of different frameworks we're going to talk about later. There's something that's called the Handlers, Messages, and Runnables framework, or the Hammer framework. And there's also something called the Async Task framework. And both of those topics will be covered beginning in week two. If you want to know a bit more about those topics, feel free to go ahead and watch the material that's available on the, uh, the uh, pre-recorded supplemental lectures. OK, so we are back. And uh, that was basically what I had intended to cover today. As you can tell, there's a lot of material that we went through. Um, the reason why I wanted to cover Java threads and Java built-in monitor objects first was because you'll need to understand bits and pieces of both of those things in order to do the first programming assignment. In the virtual office hours session tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, we will talk about the, the last piece of the puzzle you'll need to do to understand for the first assignment, which is Java semaphores. And then I'll also walk through the first programming assignment. So I'll, I'll walk through the, the skeletons, and I'll talk about how it works and what it does and why it's designed the way it is and what you'll be able to, what you need to be able to do in order to implement it correctly. And then uh, that will hopefully give you some time to ask questions and uh, have any of your doubts addressed with respect to what you're expected to do for assignment number one. So if there are any more questions about the lecture material today, this is a good time to discuss them. If there are no questions, then I'll be happy to uh, continue to answer various things that show up on the, the discussion forums. And then I'll also, uh, in a few hours, start to produce the videos from today's lectures, and I'll upload the slides and so on, and the other things that uh, we covered. And that'll help you also get access to the links that you'll need in order to be able to follow to further understand the material we covered. Okay, well, 
if I didn't get to any of your questions, feel free to post them on the discussion forum. And I look forward to talking to you soon.